Well, here we are, end of season two. Oh, we got a bit to unpack here. And I'm going to try not to mention a few things. <sighs> I like how Maul just sort of leaps in. I'm going to talk a lot about Maul in the first part of this, so forgive me. First of all, he's always been kind of a berserker, so it makes sense that his reaction to seeing them would be attack, attack, attack. But it also fits two other things. First, his desire to show through action, as rather than even trying to convince them through words. After all, the man has you know, he doesn't have a good deception score, if you follow me. But second of all, he's counting on that dynamic that I've mentioned. I hate to keep pointing it out, but the whole cooperation versus solo loner mentality thing is something that's been coming up a lot in Season 2 of Rebels, and I hope it'll be present in the future as well. Because Maul is basically couching on the idea that they will back him up and that that teamwork will help defeat them, and he's right. In fact, to skip ahead a little bit, later on Maul decides to help the others, and with the combination of their abilities, they kill all three Inquisitors. Boom, boom, boom. It's also worth noting that if all three Inquisitors had decided to approach, they might have actually managed something. But instead they decide to let, uh, I think it was Eighth Brother, go off by himself. Because that way he'll thin them out, and then we can finish it off and get the prize. Basically the exact opposite of the, the symbiotic relationship thing. And of course, that is what ultimately leads to their downfall and Maul's. If Maul had decided to just kind of keep going with them on this decided to be a true ally with them in this endeavor, rather than trying to claim Ezra and, you know, kill off his allies, he might have actually succeeded here. Instead, he decided to go back into his own ways, going back to being parasitic rather than symbiotic, and he suffered for it. I also do like how, for the most part, Maul is being quite honest throughout most of this. Not only does he, you know, there's a bit where Ahsoka says, you're trying really hard to keep us here. And he says, yeah, I can't beat Vader alone. And Maul keeps couching on the usage of the dark side to Ezra and why. And I, I just want to point out something here. I have a feeling that Maul is a true believer in the dark side. I think I've mentioned that before. That he really does agree with the philosophy and tenets, hence my terminology of calling him a true Sith. It's just he screwed it up at the last minute. I know, I know, he's a villain, whatever, the dark side's evil, whatever. He even speechifies at Ahsoka, come on. I mean, yeah, okay, there's the helicopter blades, which are dumb. But what actually irritated me most about this episode is Maul turning into a cartoony villain out of basically nowhere, just so he could be a villain and then be defeated and then be moved out of the main narrative. I do like how Kanan has to fully trust in the Force, and it costs him dearly to do it, just to outmaneuver Maul, by the way. That's a nice touch, and it's a good way of showcasing the relative power levels, as I've mentioned a few times. So then, Ezra manages to unlock the Death Station or whatever. Some ancient battle station. Hmm. I hope it doesn't have, like, some kind of mass shadow generator bomb thing. That would be just terrible. <sighs> And the, the essence of the station, the AI or whatever, says, Oh, maybe the one coming will utilize my powers. And he's like, Oh, crap, i got to go deal with that. Yeah, that's, that's not Maul. That's not Ahsoka or Kanan. Uh, that's the big guy. Notice how, once again, Vader is used very precisely in this show. To good effect. This is actually, I believe, the fourth time he's shown up total. Two of which were basically cameos. I could be wrong about that. Let me actually think about that for a second. I think this actually is he's actually closer to the sixth showing, if we're counting times where he's just kind of there and then leaves, you know, like at the very first episode. But each time Vader is used to, to any significance, it's like a scalpel, very precisely hitting a very specific narrative point. He crushes Ezra, as he should. And then Ahsoka tries to fight him, and he is a match for Ahsoka, as he should be. In fact, if anything, honestly, he probably would defeat Ahsoka in a one-on-one -on -one fight if he wasn't otherwise distracted. There's a... I, I, I cannot gush enough about the confrontation between Ahsoka and, and I'm going to say this very specifically, Darth Vader. This is the first time they have truly confronted each other, and one could argue the first time they met. As I've said before, there's a lot of variance and debate in both the EU and the AU, as to the nature and dynamic of Anakin Skywalker versus Darth Vader. 
And one of the things I've already mentioned is that the AU seems to be leaning in the direction of basically Vader being almost a separate entity, not a completely segregate consciousness, but someone who is functionally a completely different personal person. And this is emphasized many times. This actually came up in the original trilogy because that was Lucas's original idea. Well, actually, that's not true. That was more like Lucas's fourth idea, but you know how the original trilogy was. So his statement, Anakin Skywalker was weak. I destroyed him, makes clear that distinction. I know this is going to get a little geeky, but I've heard several people parallel it to the Doctor over in Doctor Who. That each individual incarnation of the Doctor may have the same memories and some of the same core impulses of the previous Doctors, but each one should be treated as its own sentient sapient entity. And I've, I've, I've heard a lot of argument that that's exactly how we should treat Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker. It's an interesting thought. I'm not sure what I think of that one. But regardless, he says he destroyed him. I like Ahsoka's response, then I will avenge his death. Uh, but revenge is not the Jedi way. Yeah, I am no Jedi. And I like that. And then there's a very awesome fight, which I can only gush about. And in the end, they get the holocron out together, by the way. Once again, symbiosis. They get, the, you know, the, they, they work together. They get that thing out. And then... Ahsoka says she's not going to leave him this time. I, I can't put into words what that makes me feel. Um, this is probably an arc that should have been built up a little bit more, but I want you to imagine, because they only really peek at this like twice in both shows, but I want you to imagine the sheer amount of guilt and shame that Ahsoka has been carrying for a decade and a half about having left Anakin Skywalker and what has happened as a result. So this time, she just refuses to. Even knowing that it's stupid, even knowing that it's probably going to kill her, she will not leave him this time. It also lends itself towards something that we know from the original trilogy, that there is an Anakin Skywalker inside of Darth Vader, even now. Although some versions of the continuity insist that Anakin didn't wake up until the battle at Yavin, but I'm just going to throw that out the window. I prefer the idea that Anakin was always sitting there in the background, buried, if you will. So the status quo is now fundamentally altered, as it should be. Ahsoka's gone. We'll talk about that later. Kanan, blind. Vader, wounded. The Inquisitors, dead. And now there's this... Oh, and Maul escaped, because of course he does. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad about that one. I, do, I find him a fascinating character, I really do. So I'm glad to see more of him. And of course, we move on, and we see a convor. I've heard a lot of fan geeks... Uh, fan geeks? <laughs> geeks. Debate over the years what the significance is of the convor. And I'm aware of the fact that the actual interviews with Filoni and the writing staff have never really shed a lot of insight into that. Which sucks, because, I mean, you, you just tell us, guys. The show's over. You can tell us now. My personal take on it is actually very, very simple. I think the Convor is more or less a metaphor. A, a, obviously a specific metaphor for Ahsoka, but also in a sort of vague term, a metaphor for the light side of the Force, as presented all the way back in that episode. those episodes I don't care for. Um, I can't think of their names. You know, the father, the son the mother, the, the three aspects of the Force. You know what I'm talking about. That whole thing. So, either way, very curious to see where we're going in Season 3. We'll see you next time, guys.